My goodness, such dramatic music. <laughs> it adds pressure to do something dramatic. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Um, we have a very small panel, you may have noticed. We had originally four of us, and then there was a late cancellation, and an even more late cancellation due to one of our members getting COVID. I haven't heard anybody get COVID in a while. Fortunately, it's becoming very rare, but... Um, but I was going to be more moderator and less talker, uh, but this is a subject near and dear to my heart, and so I'm turning into moderator and presenter along with uh, that. So uh, uh, we'll, uh, Matt Callahan of EasyJet Holidays is with me. Hi, good morning. You've seen more of me than you want, Randy Durbin, the CEO of GSTC. And uh, we're going to talk on this topic of uh, preferred contracting for supply chain development. So. Uh, let me get into it, and uh, there's my name, and um, again, the topic, um, and I want to step outside of travel and tourism a moment to, to frame up the context of the topic that we want to talk about, and I think you'll see why. Um, 1993, the Forest Stewardship Council was created to put eco labels on sustainably produced wood and paper. Everybody, who's heard of FSC? If you haven't heard of it, just by looking at this label now and listening to me, you are gonna start seeing FSC all over your lives. <laughs> it's on paper products of all sorts. But for their first eight years of their existence, they were quite unknown, like GSDC was quite unknown for a long time because they were busy developing a technical foundation for a very credible way to put an eco-label on sustainably produced wood and paper. So they laid together the technical foundation very carefully first. Then, this is um, actually from a website from Kimberly Clark, the giant of paper production and distribution in the world. And somewhere around, I don't, remember, I don't know the exact year, somewhere around 2000, 2001, somewhere in there, Kimberly Clark, this giant producer and distributor of paper, decided they should present their product as more sustainable. And they looked around and thought, how can we do that? And how can we um, have a mechanism for all of our production units to move in the right direction? and for our entire distribution channel, and then our end users at both the wholesale level and the retail level get a credible, credible message that that paper is produced in a reasonably sustainable way. So Kimberly Clark saw the eight-year-old FSC and said, aha, they've got a global network, a credible system, transparent system, a rigorous system to put an eco label on sustainably produced wood and paper. And so Kimberly Clark jumped in. As soon as the giant Kimberly Clark jumped in, their competitors did. And within a few years, FSC went from unknown, obscure, to big and famous. And now it's just amazing um, all over the world. And you're going to notice it more and more just by having seen it on paper towel dispensers and public restrooms and on business cards and books and all sorts of things. So that's what happened uh, in, our, in our space in, in terms of sustainability. Others followed suit. The Marine Stewardship Council does that for fish and seafood, ASC, Aquaculture Sustainability Council for some other fish and seafood that MSC wouldn't do. And there's all these, the Better Cotton Institute, Rainforest Alliance Coffee and Rainforest Alliance Organic uh, Chocolate, all of these. Uh, follow a very similar model of having a global network of certification units for the global production of products. And we've applied that to services. Now, before I get into what we're doing, just as an example of something here in travel and tourism that's kind of like this. So WWF has really been a driving force in the application of the FSC model and others like it in, in, in all sectors. They do that relatively quietly, uh, but they do it very much on, a, on a, a wholesale brand and development and, and product line development basis. But they're really behind a lot of these things. So just as an example of that type of model here in our industry, 
So this is uh, from November of 2019, that Ibero Star Hotels that has about 120 hotels, mostly in the Mediterranean and the Caribbean. Um, they worked with WWF and they set some targets that said that um, they're gonna convert 15% of their total seafood procurement to fish and seafood that's equal labeled by MSC and ASC. It's not a big number, 15%, but it's a big step. And then they, this is a few years ago, so they, they, the idea would they would be gradually um, improving that. But here, they acknowledge even in their um, press release, I'm sorry, the font is small, but here it says, MSC and ASC help product species, blah, blah, blah. And, and, but through Ibero Star doing this, they're extending their range. <laughs> They get more buyers to use the system. They can improve the system and make it more accessible, get auditors and certification units in more corners of the world. So it's a give and take. They need more users to build the system. They need to build the system to get more users. <laughs> and that's why, you know, at a kind of a wholesale level is what drives this model. This is what we've really seen. So, we built this model for the contracting of hotels and tour operators in the world. And so we're really uh, pushing then businesses that contract with, with hotels and, and local operators, DMCs, to do it. Um, here's a couple of examples where it's been somewhat in place. Uh, Eastern Canada, a tour operator called Transat has been doing this for years on their own. They just figured out kind of on their own that Maybe they looked at the FSC model. I don't know. They were doing this before they really got involved with us, but they've been a GSTC member for several years, and they track what we do, and we communicate regularly. Um, and all of their tour itineraries of Canadians going to Mexico and the Caribbean and elsewhere that they go, they, for years now, they've only used hotels that are certified, sustainable. And they talk about in their marketing message, too, that they, use, they go to blue flag beaches. So they get it that by looking at these suppliers and these destinations that have gone through a credible process to show the world that they're taking serious efforts on sustainability, that that's a value to them. Think about if they just tried to do that on their own. So I spent 25 plus years as an outbound tour operator and I worked on many trade associations throughout the world and I know this business of outbound tour operators. An outbound operator, even the smallest one, works with a huge number of hotels. Even if they have a favorite hotel in one place, they still have backup. They just have massive lists of hotels. If they were going to study each hotel that they use or potentially use on how sustainable they are, oh my God, they'd need a whole department looking at this all the time. And because the poor state that we have of measurement and reporting in general, <laughs> what would they look at? They, you know, the website you know, doesn't say much um, and uh, it'd be a tremendously difficult task. So using uh, hotels that have a credible equal label on them is a tremendous value in the, in, the, in the contracting process. So this is the kind of thing that we're really trying strongly to promote. Um, our panelists, this delightful Ambrose um, from uh, Austria who was going to join us and he just contracted COVID only about 48 hours ago and couldn't join us. Um, so I'm sorry he's not here to tell his story, but this is a case of a very small tour operator. Uh, his father started this business with some mountain climbing techniques and they just kind of figured out internally that you know, their supply chain is their product <laughs> and like Transat of Canada uh, said, this is what we're gonna do and so he's currently looking through all these processes. I can't speak for him, and I'm not gonna to try to, but basically what they're doing in their business, Asi Reisen, uh, the website's in German because their market is entirely German, uh, German, um, German speakers from Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, so that's their market, uh, and they sell the business uh, products around the world, and he's very much aiming for every single hotel they use, wherever they send their, uh, their clients, that they would be certified. And he's struggling with it, trying to just figure out the whole uh, ecosystem of what's out there. Um, I don't want to pretend to speak for him um, because he's not here, but I still put it as an example of a, of a business like Transat and a small one. We're going to hear from a large one <laughs> here in a few moments. 
But I do want to emphasize that this model is for everyone. Large businesses are small. If you buy something on a regular recurring basis, you have power on a wholesale level. If you buy something regularly on a wholesale level, you have power. And I would hope we more and more use that power you know, to drive sustainability. I started with Kimberly Clark, you know, one of the largest corporations in the world that use their power. But if we have everybody moving in this direction, uh, large and small, to use the power of the purchase to, to say, I want a sustainable product. When we go to the supermarket, I sometimes tell the clerk, I'm not gonna buy that because of the plastic packaging. And they think I'm weird and a hippie or whatever, I don't care. They need to hear it. I mean, we have to speak up at the retail level as shoppers, at the wholesale level. If we want the world to change, we need to change our behavior. And we have a lot more power in business at the wholesale level than we do as individuals at the retail level complaining about the plastic in the supermarket. Uh, we need the business who really buys a lot of the product. We need the supermarkets to tell, to tell their suppliers, get an alternative to, to plastic to put the produce in, to put the fruit and vegetables in. That's where we really, I think, can affect change. It's in that purchasing. Who's purchasing all those plastic units to put all that food in? They've got to tell their suppliers to change. So if we're purchasing hotels, tell them to change. If you purchase and you contract with a lot of hotels, you've got power, and I really, that's the key point of all this. The first time our model at GSTC was applied like this in a formal basis um, was cruise lines sort of acting like a tour operator. What do I mean by that? Um, if you've been in the business long enough, you probably know the distinction between what we call an outbound tour operator and an inbound tour operator. Transat example is an outbound tour operator, so is Ozzy Ryzen, the two examples I've given. EasyJet Holidays is an outbound operator. What we mean by that is they market to a, uh, certain markets to go travel from home to places, and then they hire local companies, inbound operators, to function in Antalya, to function in Athens, to function in Tokyo. So often called the DMC. So cruise lines, when they come into a port, they have in the last 20 plus years really aggressively moved to kind of control the shore excursion and they sell a package. They market it on their website before you even leave home. They have a menu on the ship. So when we get to Antalya, here are the activities you can do. You can just go on your own in freedom, but you know many clients will buy a package of shore excursion. So in 2016, WWF, just like they talked to Kimberly Clark, 20 some years ago about FSC. WWF had signed a, a long-term agreement with Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. Now, Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines is the second largest holding company of cruise lines in the world. Um, the cruise industry is tremendously consolidated. And so they have like 15 brands. And so all of these brands have committed to this strategy starting in 2016 and they continue with it. So WWF helped them with some carbon reductions, emissions, reductions per ship targets, and they did a whole series of activities. But they instigated, they initiated these two policies that speak directly to our topic today of preferred contracting. Since 2016, Royal Caribbean and all of their brands, all of their ships, their purchasers, their buyers of fish and seafood on all the ships give a preference to MSC labeled fish and seafood. So it's a tremendous driver of the producers improving their ways at all those ports. Think about how their impacts they're having. They're going to small places and saying, this is important to us. The power of their purchasing drives sustainability. And they said on shore excursions, we want the shore excursions to be operated by tour operators that are certified sustainable to the GSTC. And they, they set a target by the number of tours. We don't certify tours. We're starting to. We've got a limited program of doing that. But for the most part, we certify the tour operator. So in Royal Caribbean's messaging, it's this shore excursion is operating by a sustainably certified tour operator. But they set targets for the number of tours. 
just to confuse things, um, to get it measurable <laughs> for this, the impact of the program. So they set a target that they wanted 1,000 of their shore excursion tours uh, to be uh, operated by a certified tour operator by 2019, they said in 2016. Uh, it was so manageable that they doubled the number. Uh, they had over 2,000 tours already in 2019, um, set from that target in 2016. Today, they're at about 3,500. Another cruise line I just talked to um, is looking at doing this in a more comprehensive basis, and they did their own analysis and found out that without really trying, they had 65% of their tours covered because of the selection of, uh, of suppliers they were using had already been influenced by the Royal Caribbean program. Think about that. This is a very important point. When Royal Caribbean used its power to drive those DMCs at each port to get certified, they changed that business. I mean, just think about it. If Royal Caribbean comes to a particular port three days a week and they've pushed this DMC to get certified sustainable, to change their business practices to get certified sustainable, well, that DMC has other clients the other four days of the week. They have other clients the same day Royal's coming. They've got multiple ships coming. They've got multiple clients. But they improve their business practices to satisfy Royal Caribbean. You think they changed their business practice for when they greet the Royal Caribbean group versus the other brands? No, they've changed their business practice to one set of business practices. So Royal pushed them along the way to improve. So now a cruise line I was just talking to a couple of weeks ago in Florida said that we want to move in this direction and our analysis shows because of Royal Caribbean driving this and we're using one of the largest companies that has a lot of DMCs. <laughs> They're already at 65%. So it, it impacts change in a very positive way, the power of purchasing. So whether you're little a Aussie Ryzen with your small German-speaking client base of a small adventure travel company type, or you're a giant, uh, it's, a, it, it's the model. CLIA, the Cruise Industry Trade Association, was so excited about what Royal was doing, they invited me personally to go to Hamburg, Germany, in September 2019. I spent the full day with the Ports and Destinations Committee of CLIA talking about this model. It had the full support of Kelly Craighead, the CEO of CLIA, and Adam Goldstein at that time was the chairman of CLIA, and he was at that time the CEO of Royal Caribbean. And we had a whole workshop on it. And that afternoon, MSC Cruises says, sign us up. And so MSC Cruises followed the model. And others were all interested, but then COVID just shut down the cruise industry for three years. But I'm happy to report that the whole cruise industry is back on the discussion. That's why I went to Sea Trade in Florida recently, because we had discussions with many of them. This could transform everything. Where, so aside from whatever your feeling is about what the ships are doing on the seas, we have no direct engagement in that, but we're taking our knowledge of destinations <laughs> and our knowledge of tour operators and applying it to shore excursions very successfully, and this is really moving along. So there's so many pieces to this model. Thinking about Royal's impact on all these businesses that you know, have other customers, um, it's, it could be kind of collective action apart to, a, to an industry. There's really a lot of interesting pieces to it. So this may not be a moonshot, but, you know, sustainability is hard. <laughs> and we've got to take things, I think, uh, a strategy at a time and a piece at a time. And if you think of the power of what just has been happening with those DMCs at cruise ports, and if you could influence through your business some piece of a supply chain, you've got exponential growth. And the model way to do that is to set some reasonable targets and I think the basic model that we've been thinking about deeply and talking to a tremendous amount of players in this space, the, the hotels and the DMCs themselves and the buyers of the hotels and DMCs, is that if you have kind of a two-step process to say, today we will do what Royal Caribbean did in 2016 to say to our supply chain, we want you to be certified sustainable. And if you are, we'll give you preference in the contracting if in the bidding, we get five companies bidding for this job and one of them is certified sustainable, 
and it has the equivalent of, a, of another very good bid in terms of price and quality, it will give preference to the one that's certified sustainable. So that's stage one, preferred contracting. That's why we put it in the name of this session, preferred contracting. So it's not a requirement at this stage, it's a preference. So they put the word out, you're gonna benefit in the bidding for contracts, and then they give those businesses a three-year contract instead of a two-year contract. And that's very powerful. Stage two would be to say, three years from now, four years from now, we're, gonna, we're going to require it of all of our suppliers. Just to give a clear statement, this is where we want you to be. We know you can't be there immediately. So in 2027, we want you to be here and we're gonna show preference for it from 2023 through 2026. So I think that two-stage formula is really what, you know, I think could really change the world. Preference now, requirement later. So that's the model. One final thought, oh, oh, just to finish this though. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I've got the comment, reasonable timetables of three plus years. I think you have to be reasonable and fair. You know, it's unreasonable to say to your business, get certified tomorrow. They have to change their business practice. They have to go through the process of certification. Uh, but set those targets in years, not months, uh, not 30 years, <laughs> a few years. Uh, but this approach works at any scale. Uh, and the driver can be public sector or private. In Turkey, it's the public sector is driving this with a mandate. But I, I really think and hope that if business steps up, um, you know, it feels a lot better to satisfy the business that is my customer that wants it rather than the government forcing it upon me or something. So I think it really should be ingrained in business. So I'll close with this and we'll ask Matt to speak. I've already said this, but let's just kind of really reflect upon this. WWF has been working on this model in many sectors for a quarter of a century. They do it with palm oil, they do it with coffee beans, they do it on biodiversity. And there's a, G, um, a WWF staff person named Jason Clay. Um, I know you can't just automatically get this um, URL, but if you go to TED Talk and search on Jason Clay, there's the spelling, he's an American and his surname is Clay, C-L-A-Y. And this TED Talk is like 12 or 13 years old. And he's talking about biodiversity, but it's a timeless, description of what I'm, of the model I'm describing here, of how when WWF maps, when they map a problem, they're looking at the dangers of palm oil or the challenges of biodiversity, they study the world and look at who are the top producers that impact that issue area the most. And then they map it and they found, you know, it might be eight giants or 18 companies, whatever, but it's not 200 companies. And if they get at the businesses that control 25% of market share and convince them to change, then they, those businesses have other customers and they get exponential impact. And their analysis from a quarter of a century doing this in many sectors is that you've changed 40 to 50% of production. So that's what I was talking about earlier with Royal Caribbean pushing these DMCs that have other customers. Um, they pushed more sustainable tour operations bigger than what their own product line is seeking. That's this statistic. Quite powerful, quite powerful. So this is a lever of power that really is going to get it. And I think that it's so necessary because we see survey after survey, the market research is showing that travelers want to be more sustainable, but the time of purchase, they're so focused on price, they don't think about it. And think about your own life. Let's be honest with ourselves. I like to think of myself as quite green. When I go to the supermarket on a good day, I read all the labels. And on a bad day, I rush through and just grab things. Um, do we all read all the labels for all the products we buy? A mother who wants their children to buy, or their father to buy the most healthy food. We sometimes read the labels and sometimes we don't. So with best intentions, we don't do so very well in our busy lives. We want this provided for us. 
the market research that Booking.com and others have done show that the market wants this done for them. They want sustainable products out there. And this is a model to do it. And one final thing on Jason Clay and TED Talks. Um, again, he's talking about biodiversity, but it's the model. It's about 18 and a half minutes, this video, but it's one of the best 18 and a half minutes you could ever spend. I highly recommend it. So that's the model. That's the goal. Uh, and I think nothing could be better at getting at SDG number 12. How do you separate responsible consumption and responsible production? The consumption is tied to production, isn't it? We cannot consume sustainable products and sustainable services if the production is not giving us sustainable products and services to choose from. So I think SDG 12 is really, frankly, one of the most powerful of the SDGs. This really influences change, and I think this model really influences that. So enough of me. Matt, please. Um, Matt Callahan, Director of Customer and Operations, EasyJet Holidays. On our GSTC Board of Directors, thank you for your support. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Randy. So hopefully some slides will appear shortly. Um, for those of you that joined us in Seville in December, I had the opportunity to talk to you then and opened then with somewhat of a provocative statement, which is we've been talking about sustainability, sustainable tourism, sustainable hotels for a long time. Now, in Randy's introduction yesterday, he gave some dates that were up there about when standards were first introduced. So, friends, colleagues, if we've been talking about this for so long, why are we struggling to make much impact? Why is it that 10, 12, 15 years on, we are still in rooms like this having conversations around what can we do in order to increase hotel certification, for example? And perhaps preferred contracting is one of those. In fact, I think it is one of those, but it's not on its own. So give me a couple of minutes and share some thoughts. So my name is Matt Callahan. I'm the Director of Customer and Operations at EasyJet Holidays. Uh, amongst other things, I have board level accountability for driving our sustainability agenda. As this is a global uh, event, just forgive me those that uh, are from closer to home if I just give a little bit of context, because I think it's important to understand the perspective from which I'm coming from um, when I share some thoughts with you. So who are we? Who is EasyJet Holidays? And it's interesting because uh, Randy described us a couple of times as a big player, kind of a big brand. Uh, and we are, but we're relatively new to this scene. So we only formed our business in 2019, uh, November of 2019, some four months before uh, a certain event came along just to derail us for a couple of years. Um, but we are the fastest growing holiday company in the UK. It was our first operational year last year. We took over a million customers away on holiday. Uh, and we expect this year to have about 60% growth uh, on that. That's big. That is big. But I think the, the important uh, kind of caveat to that is we deliver this with an employee base of circa 200. The stuff that I'm going to talk to you about, about our efforts in sustainable tourism, there is one person in my team that spends 50% of his time on this. We spend no money with contractors or consultants. What you see is what is delivered with that size. So I don't want you to sit there and think, well, it's easy for these big brands that have got 20 odd people working on all of this. What I'd suggest is that this is about business prioritization and how important does your organization see some of this activity. So our mission as an organization is to become Europe's most loved holiday company. And when we talk to our people about what that means, there's four perspectives uh, or lenses through which we want to be the most loved. Uh, firstly, it's by our customers. Secondly, it's by our people. Thirdly, it's by our shareholders. And fourthly, it's by our destinations, which then leads me to our sustainability strategy. So our sustainability strategy is embedded in our overall mission and vision for our organization. But our vision, purely from a sustainability perspective, is a world where travel makes a positive impact on the environment and local communities. 
So holidays are all about the destination. It's the people and the places in our destinations that create joy, that create magic, that create those memories that we hold on to for years to come. Our mission when it comes to sustainability is to capitalize on the strength of our brand, the size of our brand, the size of our customer base, and it's to make sustainable holidays mainstream. There are many organizations that have done incredible things for a long, long time. That's tended to be focused at niche markets. Expensive eco tours, for example. Whereas actually, I think if we want to make a step change in the global sphere, it actually needs to be how can we target mainstream customers? How can we go after mass consumer travel and tourism? EasyJet, when it was founded 27 years ago, so EasyJet is the third largest uh, low-cost carrier globally, uh, has a fleet of just over 300, uh, flies circa 100 million customers uh, every year. When EasyJet was founded 27 years ago, that was all about democratizing travel, making travel accessible to people for whom previously it was out of reach. And EasyJet Holidays is also passionate about continuing that heritage, about providing credible value for money for people. And one of the things I'm going to explore later is this whole cost versus conscience. Again, I think if we were going to have some radical candor, that's a convenient excuse for too many organizations. And actually, with smarter business choices, those two things can coexist. So we are all about taking action, creating impact. You won't have seen any glossy marketing campaigns from EasyJet Holidays on its efforts on sustainability. Of course, we storytell about the efforts that we're doing. But our primary focus is on creating impact. So how do we do that? So our sustainability strategy covers three areas. Create better holiday choices. So how can we provide better choices to our customers? Um, Randy touched on some of this. Our own uh, research suggests that 70% of consumers would like to act in a sustainable way when going on their holiday. Many of those don't really know what that means. And most of those expect us to do that hard work for them. And we're fully committed to doing that. So what that's all about uh, is um, how we create those better holiday choices. The challenge, of course, when we start talking about this, and Booking.com and others have, uh, many of you may have done your own research on this, is that whole intent versus action piece. Uh, but again, I think that comes to this cost versus conscience, and if we can cut through that and actually show people that you can have incredible value for money and travel in a sustainable, conscious way. Um, then that's got to be the winning ticket, I think. Keep our holidays special. So for us, that's all about, uh, one of the main drivers in there is about hotel certification. So how can we make sure that through the holiday experience, we are keeping our holidays special, that our holidays give more than they take, and that we have a positive impact in our destinations. And then transform travel for everyone, that is about how can we use the strength of our brand in our industry to make meaningful change, and hopefully one day beyond that industry as well. Now, if I'm going to be really honest, those three sorts of things, you could probably, they probably resonate with people, but they're also probably pretty similar to what you will read in most sustainability strategies. You could probably look in the top 10 uh, travel companies, and there would all be something around this, something about consumers, something about the supply chain, and something about wanting to make a difference. So what is it, then, that makes the difference between words on paper, words in annual reports, words in strategy documents, and actually meaningful change? Well, for us, there are three elements to that. The first is education, the second is collaboration, and the third is rapid implementation. Let's just take each of those one by one. So education. This stuff is hard, right? This stuff is complicated. If it was easy, we wouldn't be sitting here, right? We would have solved some of these problems 10, 15, 20 years ago. But this is hard. As Randy said in his opening yesterday, we talk about travel and tourism as an industry, but actually when we start to break this down 
there are so many different types of organizations delivering different things, and sometimes with competing agendas. The amount of sessions that I come to, uh, and there can be quite a lot of airline bashing. Oh, well, we don't need to look at our CO2 emissions because it's all about the airlines. Well, come on, we can all point to different parts of our organizations and the supply chains where we could be doing better. But it's probably a bit more time for looking in the mirror and seeing what can we actually do, what can we control, and frankly, what can we just get on with. So collaboration. In Seville, I said that uh, this yearning for perfect collaboration is just leading to procrastination. And I still stand by it. Because in those five months since we met in Seville, I'd like you to think, in your organizations, what have you done significantly to advance your sustainability agenda? Five months, long time. I bet there's been plenty of conferences, plenty of workshops, plenty of post-it note sessions. But what have they led to? What tangible things are different in your organization today than they were five months ago? So for us, collaboration is all about finding the right partner or partners or organizations. And then, crucially, the third element, rapid implementation. Just get on with it. Get on with something. A small step forward is a step forward. Constantly trying to find the perfect solution I was at a session uh, about three months ago. And in that uh, session, uh, there were travel agents, tour operators, airlines, cruise companies, DMCs. And somebody said, well, what's the one thing that we could all work on together? And lo and behold, kind of nobody could quite agree on what we could work on together. Whereas actually, if just a couple of those organizations had got together, very quickly, I think, they would have identified, well, what could we do together? What could we trial? So for us, this collaboration and then rapid implementation are crucial. As I say, we're not a big team. We need to partner with the right organizations that can bring relevant expertise to us. So one of our partnerships is with the GSTC, and we're incredibly proud of our partnership with uh, the GSTC. And I think this partnership kind of cuts through all of those things on the right-hand side, the how. So through education, collaboration, and rapid implementation. So for example, we have uh, just last week announced a partnership with GSDC to sponsor training for our hotel partners in our three biggest markets of Turkey, Greece, Spain. So when we're talking about preferred contracting, for us, when we launched our business in 2019, there is a clause in all of our hotel contracts that says that the hotel partner will work towards uh, gaining a GSTC recognized certification. So we could, if we wanted to, start going, well, you know, page seven, clause 3.1.2 says that you're going to do this. What are you doing about it? But the fact is, we've come out of two years of the pandemic when everyone has been on their knees. And actually, for us to take a blunt instrument of you're either in or you're out facing certification, actually, I think there's some really questionable... Um, logic behind that. How can it be right to, for a brand the size of ours to just pull out of a hotel, which could affect local jobs, local community, and all the things that we're actually, through sustainable tourism, trying to improve and enhance? So instead, we're trying to take a more collaborative approach with our hotel partners, addressing the education part of our sustainability strategy. So providing training, get people to understand. There's very few of our hotel partners that say, not interested, don't want to know. Actually, the bigger chains are well on this journey already. But those smaller, particularly owner-managed properties, say, well, yeah, we'd love to do this, but like, where do we start? What do we do? So that's a really exciting uh, partnership that we launched last week. And actually, it's oversubscribed already. So next week, when we're all back in the office, we'll have another conversation about kind of how can we do some more of that. But what a brilliant problem to have, that we put something out to our hotel partners to try and help them in their certification journey and for it to be oversubscribed so quickly. So hotel certification, the bottom line. So this cost versus conscience thing, 
So I say, I do struggle with this uh, as, if, as if there's some choice. One of our other key collaborations is with the University of Oxford. And we've been working with them for about a year and a half now. And one of the pieces of work that uh, research that we completed together last summer was on food waste. And when you come to big all-inclusive resorts uh, in Turkey, you can see how food waste is such a challenge. And food waste, from a sustainability point of view, covers many different angles, right, from the environmental uh, to the impact that has on local communities, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so one of the things that we've introduced uh, uh, in one of our hotel partners is a pilot using artificial intelligence to drive down food waste. So essentially, the technology monitors the food waste and then that feeds the forecasting and ordering system and learns over time about the amount of food waste in order to optimize the ordering process. But of course, what that is doing is driving down the hotel costs. It's also better for the environment. So almost this, we have to choose between whether you're spending money or you're being good. I just, there are so many examples where it's just simply not true. Actually, to do right and reduce food waste is also hugely beneficial for the hotel's bottom line, which then, of course, we hope that they pass some of that on to us that we can pass on to our customers. But if we think about hotel certification, for all the hotels that uh, have GSTC, rec GSTC recognized certification on our website, they're uh, marked as part of our eco-certified collection. So customers can make better holiday choices, and they are informed at the booking stage about which hotels uh, do have that stamp and which don't. If you believe all of the research about consumer behavior and consumer intent, then it is likely that they are going to drive uh, more customers to look at those hotels, and as you go through the booking journey, that results in more bookings. And we're actually doing some A-B testing on that right now to look at intent versus action. Um, but the overwhelm all of the research is overwhelming in saying that uh, it is something that consumers demand. So if you believe that to be the case, then from a revenue point of view, clearly having hotel certification is a positive thing, right? It is likely, and I say we are going to, we are doing some work to, to look at exactly the commercials behind this, likely to drive more bookings, tick. What else is in it for the hotel? Well, through the food waste example, reduction of cost, but also when we're consumers, we don't put on a different hat than when we're an employee. So if these sorts of things are important to, to us as consumers, they're also important to us as employees. So what are the other benefits for attraction and retention of talent for hotels that can demonstrate their sustainability credentials versus those that can't? What are the brand enhancement opportunities for hotels that can talk about their certification versus those that can talk about some of the stuff that they may or may not be doing? What are the other intangible benefits? What grants, what local uh, bursaries, what additional funding is available through local, regional, national governments for those that can demonstrate that they are taking their sustainability journey so seriously. So there are so many potential upsides for our hotels when they go through their certification journey that I really think rather than conscience versus cost, we should be talking about the value of values. So, in summary, and hopefully we can open this up to some lively questions and debate, uh, we are all about trying to make sustainable holidays mainstream. We believe that if we want to tackle some of the global issues that we've got today, the biggest holiday companies need to step up and start making more of a positive impact. We do that through education, collaboration, and rapid implementation. So let's all constantly learn. We are hungry to learn more. We are humble, we do not have the answers to these problems, but we find the people that do, and we get on with something. And then finally, sustainable hotels. It is our belief that there is a clear business case and why uh, accreditation, certification is so important. But for us, the way we will do that is we will support our hotel partners to achieve that. We think that is going to have a better medium and long-term impact 
uh, because we recognize that certification is just one element of being sustainable and uh, doing good in the local communities. So thank you very much for your time. That's it for me for now, but hopefully we can open for questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. We start to see a few questions appearing here in Slido, so uh, we'll dive into that. And um, I, I do want a quick comment, though, on, on a bit about, um, I don't mean to say that a full supply chain could be 100% certified necessarily. If I look at the cruise model, and I think this would apply to any outbound tour operator like yourself, you're going to go to some off-the-beaten-path places. <laughs> where there may not just be a lot of DMCs. There might be one, and they're so small, <laughs> they don't have the resources to do it. So I think coupled with the model is some kind of minimum standards, code of conduct, something like that. You give guidance to the smallest of players. Uh, and we've dealt, I've had this discussion with the cruise lines because of a positioning cruise that only goes to some island once or twice a year. We're not gonna hold them to the same standard. So, you know, the model has that flexibility, right? So, uh, but yet if you put the word out, get most of your suppliers going, uh, I think the model is sufficient. Is that a decent comment on? Yeah. You wouldn't go 100% on certification requirements. Of, uh... Uh, I think for us, certification is a key part of the journey. Um, but one of the things that we're also really keen on is if we zoom out a little bit, and think about what are we trying to achieve here. We're trying to make tourism a force for good. We're trying to make sure our holidays give more than they can take, and in doing so, make sustainable holidays mainstream. Certification is an important part of that, but it is not the only part of it. Um, so whilst we will continue to support our hotel partners uh, to achieve that, we are also conscious that we need to recognize and celebrate the good things that people are taking on their sustainability journey. Because I think it's in, it is really important to continue to inspire and motivate hotel partners uh, on this journey because it can be difficult, particularly on the back of kind of the pandemic two years. Yeah, good. All right, let's look at Slido, see what the audience has in their minds. Fortunately, the first three are um, upvoted in the sequence that they've been sitting here, so we'll take it from the top. First, where in your experiences do you offer options that benefit local communities, and what is the corresponding percentage of that from overall sales? I rather doubt if anybody has that kind of data. We don't even have good data on carbon, um, much less, uh, you know, really less tangible data on impacts of communities. But I think it's um, important to point out that in the GSTC criteria, which is to say that includes GSTC recognized standards, there are requirements for businesses to have positive community impacts. Local hiring is, is uh, as a box to tick in a meaningful way. Um, equal opportunity, job development, and so forth. Um, well, let me just kind of stay with the cruise model because, you know, it gets a lot of criticism for, you know, let's face it, let's be very honest at Cruise Line. They want the people, they want the client to stay on the ship as much as possible to spend money in the bar and the casino. They make most of their profit in the bar and the casino. <laughs> let's be honest. Um, but the client wants to get off the ship once in a while. Um, and, you know, so they, to a large degree, historically, we've kind of controlled that experience. So when we're looking at the business and when we're looking at destinations in terms of how they manage, we're looking at the impacts and the job conditions, the working conditions of, of community that, ser you know, that services those people coming off. So those, those elements are, are, are baked in and not totally ignored. But the essence of the question, I, can't I don't know of any significant data. Can you think of anything in your supply chain where we have community are you looking at that from your company? Of a no, 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 not currently. Um, I don't know who, whether the question was specifically about when we're talking about experiences, whether that was kind of tours, excursions. I don't know, I don't know if anybody wants yeah, to. Yeah, it was pretty open. Where in your experiences do you offer options that benefit local communities? So uh, if we talk about tours and excursions, we partner with Musement um, to deliver uh, those. Uh, and amusement have started to do some great things uh, in that space, but you know, they're on, I don't know if anyone from amusement in the room, but I think it's fair to say they're relatively early on in their journey. Um, uh, but that's something that, you know, any support that we can lend them in that. Um, but yeah, I think this is, 
as an industry, I think we are relatively uh, infantile when it comes to this. I would hope that in our auditing process, you know, our auditors would never tolerate if there was a shore excursion, for example, that was operated by everybody, staff coming off the ship to do all the work, <laughs> hiring local people. That's, that's an essential element of uh, the social section B of a, of a GSTC criteria. Uh, let's move on then. The next one, would the tour operators be able to measure the sustainability impact of their preferred contracting with, with suppliers? Would suppliers share data with operators? Yeah, thoughts? Yeah, so I can talk a little bit about the things that we are doing, um, which is more about probably the commercial benefits um, of certification, which I've mentioned kind of the A-B testing to understand uh, consumer action versus consumer intent. So to what extent do uh, customers select eco-certified hotels from our collection uh, over non-eco-certified. Um, but also, we are now at the scale where we can uh, more reliably measure customer satisfaction in certified hotels versus non-certified hotels to see there, is there anything interesting in those data sets, um, which again, hopefully would act as incentives for uh, hotel partners that are still on the journey and are not quite there yet. Um, to turbocharge their efforts. But if this is more around uh, kind of through the supply chain, almost kind of the scope three emissions type world, uh, then no. And anyone that's been in any of the sessions that talked about scope three emissions, um, kind of you can normally hear the audible sigh that goes through the room as everyone thinks, how on earth are we going to grapple with some of those things that are coming down the track? But this is where there's the whole macro versus micro thing. Because I think what is really important is that we celebrate and storytell some of the great individual things that uh, hotel partners are doing. So I was uh, on Tuesday out at uh, one of our properties near here that we send thousands of customers to every year. And I wasn't aware of work that they do um, with turtles. But that's one thing, and we don't, so I wasn't aware, we don't talk about that anywhere on the website, but that's something that actually for some people would be really interesting and actually might make a choice about whether they go to that hotel uh, or not. So I think that one of the things that I'm taking back uh, to London this week is what more can we do to storytell those micro events, those really good things that some of our hotel partners are doing that are having a really positive impact because actually, we need some of those in order to capture people's imaginations. Because some of this, if we're really honest, right, you start talking about sustainability, or particularly if you start talking about carbon emissions, most people, sorry, a lot of people, not interested. They, oh, you know, we can't be, can't be doing that. Particularly when we're talking about holidays, by the way, which is an opportunity where people think, you know, that's my escape. I diet before I go on holiday so that I can feast when I'm on holiday. I have a glass of wine at lunch when I'm on holiday, but I won't do that at home. And that can sometimes jar with some of the sustainability narrative. Um, so I think that's another kind of collective challenge for us about when we're trying to engage and inspire consumers. How do we do that in a way that really captivates people and makes this real? And I think you make it real and you bring people in by telling stories about local businesses or specific things that hotels are doing or the impact that something has on local people's lives, as well as trying to paint the bigger picture. Pierre, please leave this one on top. I want to comment on this one. From a kind of our broad perspective of work we do around the world, you know, I would say that tour operators are struggling to measure um, sustainability impacts in a comprehensive way. Many um, tour operators are very good at, at measuring a few specific things. You know, of course, there's focus on carbon um, and focus on plastics, which is all very necessary. Um, can you put that back on top, if it's possible? Well, anyway, I keep speaking to it. Is the tour operators measuring and reporting on sustainability? My answer is that my comment is that specific elements of sustainability get some attention. But yet, because we don't have very common measurement tools, the data is kind of all over the board. But the answer is there is some, uh, quite a bit of that, 
but it's very specific to each tour operator's priorities. Which is typically energy, climate change, greenhouse gases, carbon, uh, and to some degree plastic, uh, but, uh, but not in a holistic way. Uh, and this is why in my comments yesterday, um, I made the comment too that we really as a next phase, as a broad community, we really need to work on measurement together. We need common universal measurement tools. We need carbon calculators for hotels and carbon calculators for DMCs. And uh, there's a lot of interest in that, but that's going to take some time to develop to really draw that out. Is that fair to say that we've got kind of isolated success stories, but not so, not very good at all in a comprehensive way? Thank you. Okay, so um, when would uh, the next one, when would EasyJet require GSTC certification for all of its suppliers? Is there a deadline? Has, any, has EG, EasyJet been certified as a tour operator? I'll let you talk about the tour operators um, bit, Randy, but if I just take about deadlines. So at the moment, we haven't. Um, and, but we are measuring every month the number of uh, hotels that we have uh, got in our collection that do have certification. And that in itself is a challenge, by the way. I don't know who else is experiencing this data quality challenge that can exist where kind of the way like our the way we the, the name that we give a hotel might be slightly different to the name that GSTC give it or Travel Life give it or that the hotel itself gives it or that's on Google right and some of these can just be words that are transposed but then throws out all sorts of challenges, or the latitudes and longitudes are slightly different. You're like, is that the same hotel or is it not? Or the hotel changed its name three years ago, and we've so it, there are not uh, insignificant challenges behind uh, some of the data. Um, so I think there's a collective challenge for the various different stakeholders there to get together to see how we can make this as easy and seamless as possible. Uh, and actually, when we're having this a similar conversation in Seville. I don't know if, it's, if Jazz is in the room, but um, Jazz from Because uh, is worth a conversation here, and that's work that GSTC and EasyJet Holidays and others are doing um, to try and improve the data quality. Um, that organization really helping tour operators get a single version of the truth from GSTC over which hotels um, are certified and who are not. So we haven't set a formal deadline. We would hope that uh, in five-year time horizon, we were well into the 90% of hotels that we had got certified. We haven't officially set that as a target for ourselves. Um, we will be doing that uh, in the autumn uh, when we set kind of the, uh, a range of sustainability-related KPIs for the five years. Um, we want to be able to report on those internally and externally. I think that external accountability is really important. Uh, and that also includes kind of holding your hands up when you've not quite hit something. I think that's a really important antidote to the greenwashing allegations that can fly around. And particularly with some of the uh, European Union legislation that's coming down the path, that's going to be increasingly important that we can say, look, this is what we're trying to do, this is how we're doing it. And either, yes, we've achieved it, and here are the reasons why, or no, we haven't, and here are the reasons why. Um, so I think that transparency. So has EasyJet been certified on GSTC tour operator? No. Uh, I hear cries of hypocrite at the back. Um, and this is just the case of prioritization of uh, activities and tasks. Is that something that we will do? Absolutely. Um, but right now, with the uh, resource that we've got available, we're saying how can we make, what's going to make the biggest strides towards that mission of making sustainable holidays mainstream? And actually, we think because of the set of our business, that is through our supply chain. It's our supply chain that is delivering the holidays for our people, not us directly. I would say kind of looking at our work broadly on the two dimensions of this question on the um, requiring certification, I felt more passionate about this in February of 2020 than I do today because I felt, you know, before COVID there was momentum and movement and, you know, I think it's just so reasonable to say, you know, many businesses lost 90% of revenue and 60% of employees. It's just unrealistic to think there could have been continuity. And, and 
lot of the certifications we're seeing, we're just struggling to get renewals. Fortunately, business is bouncing back very rapidly, but there's not enough staff and everybody's super busy and uh, just getting renewals is kind of a priority to kind of get back on track. So I think it's a, a very fair question to like uh, ask us all, everybody in this space, much harder a year from now, but COVID impacts were absolutely profound in this space. Um, businesses were fighting for survival. And so from a certification standpoint for the past year, it's about can you get the renewal process going again? Can we get auditors on site again? I mean, this is all really still quite recent. So uh, we all deserve a bit of space on that. And the latter part, I want to say this about not to defend EasyJet not being, well, sort of, because I want to defend the category of outbound tour operators not being certified. Now, GSTC, broadly speaking, in one way, we're very passive. We got the GSTC criteria out there, and you can use them in ways that work for you to the degree that we're proactive and trying to influence change, we're a very low resource organization. And we've taken the strategic judgment to say, before we push outbound tour operators too hard and suggesting they get certified, we strongly say to them, get your DMCs and your supply chain, push them to get certified. The unit of certification is very important in certifying anything. An outbound tour operator we don't really care so much about how much they're recycling and managing water in their one office in uh, Tokyo or New York or Berlin. What's super important is their contracting process with that huge supply chain network. And so we're putting our own efforts into just pushing DMCs to get certified. And in fact, we may well, I'm not saying this is a matter of policy, but we're really looking hard at including in tour, outbound tour operator certification, judging them on the percentage of hotels and DMCs they've, they're contracting with certified. We just, whether we ever go that direction or not, the point is what they do in the contracting is, is extremely important. Uh, for, you know, so the difference between outbound tour operator is profound. They're very different businesses. And so we think we need the building blocks of local DMCs, inbound operators uh, certified first. So therefore, I hope you do start setting, not necessarily deadlines, but <laughs> preferred uh, tracking. So those are our comments. Uh, moving on, thank you for all of your activity here. It's picking up uh, some good upvoting. So I'm going to go with the upvoting. UNWTO, I haven't read these yet. I got behind. UNWTO stated that less than 5% of tours, total spend goes to local communities. With initiatives you detailed, are you able to achieve higher than this percent, higher than 5% of the spend going to local communities. Since you're a panel of one, I start with you. And then I'll speak broadly about what we see. Uh, so I don't know is the honest answer to that. Um, I think it's something that we need to continue to uh, look at. One of the uh, other piece of work we are doing with Oxford University is to try and find a way of getting common ways to talk about some of these things, right? Because different countries have different measures and even definitions of words are different. So when we say local communities, what do we mean? Um, when we say percentage of tourists total spend, what do we mean? And of course, that matters, because if we're not clear on what those terms mean, then frankly, the number that comes before it is somewhat irrelevant. Um, so we're trying to get a better understanding of uh, that, because measurement is important, but we need to make sure we're measuring the right things with the right definitions of terms. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know whether the Torex examples are relevant here. Yeah, I mean, you know, that answer just is so specific to different uh you know, types of, uh, of, of operations and where you go and so forth. Um, but I think, um, you know, certainly within the GSTC criteria in the social section, it speaks to um, local procurement as much as possible. Um, and, uh, and, and, and those things need to be looked at. I, I don't know that how much that data is really broken down by category. I'm not sure how directly it 
fits into the precise topic of the day, but uh, it's obviously a concern to all. But again, it comes back to measurement. How do we really get out of specific business if we don't have common measurement tools of, uh, of these things? And we're just so poor in measurement in general. Um, I want to um, skip down to Luigi Cabrini, not just because he's my boss, um, but I think we got um, a very nice specific question of specific examples of cost savings that hotels can, uh, can follow. Um, there's a couple that I think we're seeing tremendous success in. Um, energy, um, detector systems, the cost of technology um, is, is, is coming down dramatically. Um, but along with technology, you need staff training. Um, I have a personal frustration and pet peeve with the key card that many hotels install. And it really annoys me if they got points for lead certification for the building construction to install that, and they don't uh, prohibit their housekeeping department from leaving a card in 24 hours a day to completely defeat the purpose of having the card slot. I mean, how many of us have seen an extra card left there the whole time? And almost, I, you know, almost all the time. <laughs> so, um, but we're, 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 we're seeing some movement. Um, one GSTC member who's here, Ascot Hotels in Singapore, they have 900 properties. They're moving towards very dramatically and rapidly to a dual sensor program in their hotel rooms. So one sensor detects motion, but they don't necessarily turn the electricity off if there's no motion and shut off the air con because somebody might be napping. So they have a second sensor to detect. The temperature should be this. If it's one degree higher, then there's probably a human in there napping. Isn't that amazing? The technology can do that. And that technology is not expensive. So I think we're going to get better and better, but there's already a lot of good things in energy. Even Las Vegas, with all of its lights, as soon as LED lights came out, everybody in the world went to LED lights, even Las Vegas. And the cost of electricity and the production of lights just went down immediately. So energy in general, I think there's a lot of good movement because of technology. And another one we're really starting to see an increase in awareness is food waste. Um, I was in a uh, session earlier, Jim Sano, WWF, talking about this. Um, you know, food waste is the third most identifiable greenhouse gas contributor. What I mean identifiable is something you can really you know, describe. The largest contributor that you can identify to greenhouse gases is the economy of the United States of America. The second largest greenhouse gas contributor you can identify is the economy of China. The third largest contributor that you can identify is global food waste. Why? Because food production, it's carbon to produce it. Fertilizers, chemicals go in. It's carbon to deliver it, distribute it to the plate in a variety of ways. And then when there's food waste, it, goes largely into a landfill because we have so little composting in the world uh, or feeding it to animals um, that when it goes into a landfill, the methane is worse than carbon. Uh, very high rates of methane as a greenhouse. Now, gr methane is only 20% of greenhouse gases, only 20%. It's a big number. <laughs> we don't talk about methane enough, right? Uh, and there's tremendous gains. We see um, some very huge success stories in, in, in hotels where they do not decrease the quality of food, they do not decrease the customer satisfaction, but with some measurement techniques and some management techniques, hotels are making tremendous gains on reducing food waste without, again, impacting quality. So those are the two things that I see most in our work when we talk to hotels and hotel groups, is energy and food waste. And so um, we've just now finished um, putting really baseline requirements in our auditing process for the certification bodies, for the auditors that are going to have specifics like this. And, uh, and, and so we're going to get better, I think, as a whole community on, uh, on, on, on these reductions. And I'm happy to report that some of the biggest reductions, you know, are uh, driven by things that can reduce cost. Uh, and that, of course, is a business, you know, it's, of course, a driver. Um, everybody wants to reduce their costs. So the, uh, another one that's coming on strongly is uh, water purification and sterilizing the 
wa glass water bottle inside the hotel. Uh, there are a number of service providers that are growing up. We're now getting we're now getting an economy of scale where there's enough providers that can sell the units at a good cost scale that more and more hotels have that available. We should be we should have single use plastic water bottles in guest rooms out of hotels immediately, because uh, the the processes even in developing countries are low enough now that everybody can convert. We're seeing more of go down the hall with your container to refill your water or uh, glass bottles instead of plastic in the room. Uh, and all of those save money. You can have a water purification and sterilization and cleaning of your glass bottle in-house that's cheaper than buying all that plastic. So why aren't we doing it? It's lack of awareness. Uh, but that's something that uh, is ready to go today. So th there's some things like that I think we just need to elevate awareness. Do you have anything to add on the hotels? No. I did it so well. Okay, Natalie asks, you mentioned separati separating feedback from customers staying in certified versus non-certified hotels. Are customers having better experience in sustainable properties? Any thoughts? So uh, yeah, we're measuring that uh, right now. We don't, because we at the start of the season, of course, we don't have enough data that's come through for that to be of meaningful sample sizes for us yet. Um, but absolutely, when we get further through the season and then certainly at the end of the season, we'll be able to look back with uh, statistical confidence on kind of what that shows, if anything. But I think it's really interesting learning whatever the outcome is, right? Which is another example of Let's just do something, right? Let's just be able to cut our data in a way that means that we can test the hypothesis that says hotels now eco-certified collection have a higher customer satisfaction than those that don't. Do you want me to quick fire just a couple of sure. these other ones? Uh, so Patrick, uh, three-year time window percentage of hotel portfolio. So probably, I think I've kind of covered that. We'll do something in three years and something in five years. Um, we're grappling currently with what the measure should be, right? because percentage of portfolio ends up, if you're not careful, you over years compare apples with pineapples with oranges because of movements in the portfolio. Right? You could suddenly partner with a new chain that is all uh, certified, and then that's going to distort things. So it might be that we actually do this on absolute numbers, and we can do a waterfall to show those that have entered and left uh, the program. Um, but that just shows in itself how trying to figure out uh, how to measure is really important um, because there are inherent flaws in all of these. Uh, it's just trying to find the least flawed approach. And importantly, then stick with it. Because once you've then set your stall out, you can't then be changing it in two years' time because it's showing something that doesn't really fit the corporate narrative that your PR department want to go out with. But if it's going to be critical, just like with accounting standards, right? I'm an accountant. Um, you can't just change those from one year to the next. Right? You have to make sure that they are consistent so that stakeholders can reliably compare one year to the next. That's critical when we're talking about sustainability metrics as well. So our time is actually up, but I'm going to ask Matt for one minute or less. Um, I very much like, is it Melin Melissa's got some great questions, but does uh, EasyJet have default preference sustainable certified hotels in search? Are you marking in any way the search results of your product line on sustainability in any way, and what are your aspirations? So, uh, and then we'll stop. Sorry, we're out of time after this. So, uh, let me just three things that we're doing. Firstly, you will soon be able to search. So, when you do a result, you'll soon be able to filter your search results on eco certified or non eco certified. Um, so that's, uh, I think, a really positive thing. Secondly, we are uh, in through our sustainability hub, uh, which go and have a look, by the way, if you're interested in some of the stuff that we've been talking about today. Um, you can link from our sustainability hub to get the complete list of eco-certified. So if you only want to see those, um, then you can do that. Uh, and thirdly, uh, it escapes me what my third point was. <laughs> it was something brilliant, I'm sure. But lunch is in the way. Lunchtime, thank you all so much for the great questions and your attention. I uh, hope it was uh, worthwhile for you. So thank you, Matt. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Enjoy lunch. Slip 
just right by you. Your dream.